good morning. 543 CST, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Do you know where your children are? <laughs> or do you know where you're going? You know, Jesus said, our time is always ready. We don't know the day of our death. You know, the devil said you will not surely die, but you'll buy the graveyards and they're standing room only, right? So there's plenty of evidence that God was telling the truth to Adam and Eve. Don't eat of the thing that I told you not to eat of, lest you die. And they did it, and uh, they died. And so all die in Adam. So if you're merely associated as a human being, and you're proud of the fact that you're a human and not a chimpanzee or something, and that's the extent to which you have confidence. Uh, you're trusting in something that is going to pass away. And there's evidence, just, you know, how many people feel uncomfortable driving by a graveyard? Well, the Bible said that in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, that people would run to and fro in the last days and knowledge would be increased so you go out and you look at the traffic and people going to and fro in modernized vehicles and uh, with gasoline power and electric power all that are evidences again you know you've got the gravestones that show dead people that god was telling the truth you have uh electric power by which we're communicating now and the technology so that there's evidence that God's word is true now God told Noah after the flood uh, that seed time and harvest cold and heat sun and moon all these things would not perish from the earth while the earth remains and so that tells you for one thing, the earth is not going to always remain. It doesn't tell you that uh, explicitly, but there's implication. You go on and read the rest of the Bible, which is what I'm getting to. So there are things that are true in the Bible that we can observe, and they make sense. They're solid ground of truth. And so uh, if, the, if that portion is solid, God hopes, you know, the, the creation itself testifies of the character of God, the, the goodness of God. I tell people, they, they say they don't believe in God. I say, well, take a breath. It's good and it's invisible. Okay, well, uh, that shows intention. You know, there's intent that you as a created thing if you believe that the Bible said you're a created thing and so there's evidence that the Creator has provided you with air to breathe you know just like if you had a puppy dog or something and it was scared or something or shivering your tendency if you had any kind of compassion in you would be to pick up the puppy and hold it or wrap it in a blanket or turn up the heat in your house um, something along those lines now in our time we have reports like people have children and they have allowed them to starve to to literally to death because they're playing video games <laughs> I mean we are a long way gone in this because we have left the Lord, we, we don't have a sense of the fear of our Creator. Can you imagine? I mean, that is that is about the most abominable thing I think I have ever heard. You know, most people have, if they're going to kill somebody or if you're going to have Hitler with, you know, responding to the Treaty of Versailles and the, the injustice and the over punishment of Germans just because they had better weapons, they, you know, they killed them by the millions and they they when the other when the allies finally triumphed or the act not the axis but the allied powers of uh, England and France and America finally uh, triumphed over Germany you know 
<clears throat> if they had been fair-minded, I mean, both sides responded to their allies, the commitments they had made. There wasn't really one that was evil uh, over the other. Um, but they both responded to the commitments they had made to their to their uh, brother nations. And yet when victory, uh, the victory was at such a high cost. If you've ever studied anything about World War One, it's just horrific. The, the, it was the first time, you know, people really encountered the technology I was mentioning early. Knowledge had increased to the point where there was automatic rifle fire and just millions of men perished. And there was such a such a, a desire to have some kind of revenge that they, the Treaty of Versailles was not a normal treaty. It was very vindictive to where Germany had wheelbarrows full of marks, their currency uh, to buy a loaf of bread or something. And the inflation was so high, we're having inflation now, and we, we whine a little bit because, I mean, and we blame the president. It's not the president's fault, okay? There is some blame because he should be uh, encouraging domestic production and so forth to stimulate our own economy. Uh, to that end and, and that we could, you know, continue to prosper uh, and not, you know, getting crazy about global warming as if it's the fault of the United States that basically uh, we are cleaner in our use of fossil fuels than other nations that, uh, and we know this, I mean, you go to China, they wear masks everywhere because their air is brown. You know, I even went to to Athens back in 1984, and you always see the pictures and the postcards of this pristine, clear blue, you know, airbrushed thing. And when I went to Athens, and I'm from Los Angeles, California originally, and the air was pretty brown there when I was a kid. We used to wheeze, you know, when we were practicing football. And I wasn't even in the worst part. But I'd look across and you could see it pack up against the mountains, just a brown line at the foothills, you know, and it's just disgusting. And people looked at that and they said, well, let's, let's do some catalytic converters and different things uh, because of the grace of God and that we actually, you know, have some sense of human... Uh, life it's from the Lord you know when you have a heart of flesh that cares something about life and maybe even labors to respond to human need you're demonstrating <clears throat> at least <clears throat> semblance of natural affection okay or affinity some kind of motivation that you want to do good you might even want to do it for your own praise or your own honor which is not fitting but you know at least you show our educational system tries to foster this sense of a community and that we have regard for one another, love your neighbor as you would love yourself. At least we have the golden rule uh, somewhat in our upbringing. You know, what happens later, uh, we'll get into. But, you know, uh, places like China or India have false gods and they're made of stone and they're made of, uh, you know, fashioned out of wood or something. And the Bible says the kind of God that you serve is the kind of person you will be. And so the evidence is there. They, they have very little regard for human life by comparison because they simply have not received the Lord as they should. And so they pollute uh, without much regard for human life and so the, the, the earth has probably warmed by that agency. I mean, those, there's really lots. Of, I mean, they have cities in China where there's 12 million people in a city. I mean, that's just, we can't even imagine. Can you imagine rubbing shoulders? You go to New York City and it's like that. But imagine that in just about every uh, major city that you go. And... Those people are using automobiles, they're using electricity, they're using coal, 
And if you don't regulate it to some extent, you know, you don't try to use the science to make it burn cleaner, better filtration, uh, waste management, all the things that go with that, that, you know, a lot of builders in this country, they kind of complain if the OSHA guy shows up and, and tells them to shut it down or, you know, you got this checklist if you, when I come back and so forth. That's called government. You're supposed to be regulated because your tendency is going to be to cut corners. Uh, if there's, you know, supply lack or something, you might just, you know, well, we'll just, you know, try to maximize profits by some adjustment that we make. And we might put uh, the environment on the back burner in such a case. I, I'm not well enough experienced to go into particulars but we know human tendency and we've heard stories of you know dumping mainly uh, of waste where it's polluted water tables and people have uh, suffered terribly and, and yet because of the Lord <clears throat> those things <clears throat> come to light so your secret sin will find you out and we have that operate typically in our nation because of God and reverence for God and, and the faith of Jesus that's here still in this country. And uh, that is what I like to call the secret sauce of our success. Now, <laughs> we, we're not really observing uh, as much blessing as we might in this country. <clears throat> and the reason is that when you get prosperous, now the, the, the Lord had warned Israel, he said, when you go into the land from your time of slavery, and like you consider you, you work a job, maybe you come in kind of as a low person and you have to work long hours and hard for not as much money and you're watching the boss with his beautiful children, you know, robed in beautiful clothes and they go to the, and you feel like you're, you know, if he's a good boss, you might not mind that. You might not see yourself as an up-and-comer. You're just content with your wages and all that. And you, you kind of are glad to see somebody else, you know, benefiting from your labor. And that's a nice attitude. Uh, but um, the tendency of people that get prosperous, God predicted it. He said, look, when you come into the land, and you are rich and increased with goods and you're you're living in houses you didn't build you know you're you're doing all this stuff uh enjoying the vineyards of people that you know you've driven out because they were sinners uh you've been given grace to be a, a holy people and a light and an example of what god would um do for a people that would obey and serve him. Now, Adam and Eve had the Garden of Eden, and they uh, could eat freely of all the trees in the garden, and they enjoyed each other's company, and and uh, they were tasked with you know taking care of the garden and tending it and so forth. And they would have had children, um, and then God would have taught them wisdom incrementally as he does us now you know but the devil said no just take it all in one bite and you'll be wise it's like magic okay instant you know gratification of your lust to be like God now God had a plan to bring us along you know a new creation we were then and he you know Adam was learning and, and naming the animals and receiving wisdom and if he'd have had children of course you would have had to probably build a fence you know, around that, that tree and different stuff uh, to keep the kids from running amok. And, and then you would have had a society based upon some kind of uh, restraint of humanity toward uh, growth and maturity, orderly progression, and a family could have ensued. But instead, they took the bait of Satan, which was to gobble it in one bite. And so get it all now, and God's holding back from you. And so they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and died. And so 
we find ourselves now under the the response of God to that which is you have to labor to restrain your flesh you know everybody knows that if you don't have a job and you just sit around idle that uh, your flesh will still have desires you know you'll see the pretty girl on TV and you'll lust and you'll want that the desire of the slothful kills him because his hands refuse to labor so you you get jealous or covetousness uh, sets in and then you've passed your prime you, you've missed out because you just sat on your duff while you should have been studying or laboring and so you find yourself uh, without the things that you might have had and instead of coming to God in repentance and saying well Lord uh, you know I've been a knucklehead for too long and I've missed the boat so forgive me uh, Jesus died for me and I need forgiveness of this sin where I've been lazy, complacent, without vision, uh, slothful in the things that I had to do. I was not diligent and so I've ended up poor and needy and, and yet I still have these desires that you know I'd like to have a pretty wife or a young someone helping me you know who'd love in me and I could love her we could have children we could have all the things that you may have maybe you're awaking finally to the to the idea that well I it has passed me by okay well the good news of that is there's a place called heaven okay and through faith in Jesus Christ you can awake to that and say well I've missed the the good of earth I could have had by choosing stupid. I, I chose drugs, even though even Nancy Reagan said say no, and you know, you know she didn't she didn't have a really balanced, you know, approach. She she was looking at for a medium and you know and, and looking after witchcraft to try to solve her problems and deal with her burdens. So she became you know it, it kind of poisons her witness of this and so people are like oh she's kind of a doddering old woman saying foolish things and her husband didn't stand up and say honey we don't do that we're Christians you know and so he forgot for 10 years you know there's judgment God judges things John F. Kennedy was a war hero he he gave you know for his men and and swam and rescued men that were wounded and he was honored for that yet in his vanity and pride and lust he went after strange women even though he had a beautiful wife that was virtuous and godly and was trying to you know be decent she was like a queen in the way she behaved herself never dressed immodestly never you know, like the like uh mrs trump was paraded in front of the French president with a mini skirt on. Come on, man, we're, we're not right with God, okay? And she's a nice lady, but that's just stupid. You, you have to be, you have to be holy if you want a second term. You know, you can't, you know, your rape victim that you may have, maybe he raped her, this lady that came forward. And, you know, in the Me Too movement and, and this stuff that we've had go on because our chickens have just come home to roost. I mean, Donald Trump is a good example of somebody that brought a lot of baggage with him to his time of destiny. And he just couldn't deal with it. I mean, you, you've, got, you've got enemies coming at you seven ways and you have no power to remain on on mission you know you've got to spend all this time trying to look good when you're covered in filth and you know the blood of Christ is there for that um, but the admonition to a younger person like I was talking about President Kennedy everyone wanted to cover him even his brother Robert you know tried to cover his shame and and yet Robert took bullets too for that. He should have been, you know, more honorable and said, yes, my brother was a sinner and vile and he received for the wrong that he's done. But we respect persons. We want to cover shame. Uh, 
pegging ourselves, but you know you're a, you're a public figure. You have an opportunity to stand for righteousness and say, well, my brother was honorable in his youth, but he went into sexual sin and immorality, and he caught bullets because he was not living right. And God is a judge. The wages of sin is death. Marilyn Monroe, his adulterous lover, bragged about, oh, I got me a president. Billy Graham came to her and said, you need Jesus. She said, I don't need your Jesus, and died three days later. God is a judge, and so we should fear God. And one of the reasons to fear God is because of the forgiveness that he has in store. And if we deny him and the gift of his son, he sent Jesus, God so loved the world, seeing us in this deplorable condition, even the most noble among us uh, often have dirty laundry that comes out and they don't deal with it well because they're ashamed and, and they're trying to uphold this Camelot or some artificial flavoring that we're trying to maintain, you know. But the truth is, uh, the, the call is still the call. You know, <clears throat> there in the book of Acts where Peter had denied the Lord, I mean, three times. And, you know, it's written in the Bible that Peter denied the Lord three times. And we could have stopped the story right there. We could have said Peter denied the Lord three times, yet he's going to hell because there's... But you see later that Jesus was gracious to him because he knew Peter was weak and, and he just feared death and the Holy Ghost had not been given yet. And so you could compare him with Judas. Judas never really came into faith. Peter had been with the Lord and, and trying his best and serving God and even had a revelation of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, to demonstrate God was speaking to him. And so Jesus had prayed for Peter, seeing he was honest and trying. Judas, on the other hand, doesn't demonstrate at any point that he was honest. And so the Lord had, give, you know, had something to work with with Peter, and so he uh, gave him grace, and he repented, and then he was able to receive the power to be a witness. And he was a witness of the grace that God had given him out of that forgiveness. And so with God, there's forgiveness that he may be feared. So you want to fear missing on the grace of God. And okay, you did your drugs, you did your carousing, you did your wildlife, you, maybe you're a workaholic, you worked yourself to death, and now you're injured, and your glory is past, and now what do you have? Well, all that is designed to make you poor. Not poor financially so much, but poor spiritually. Let the rich rejoice in that he is made low. That's the hope of America, believe it or not. When the AR-14, 15s mow down our children in the hands of these disillusioned you know, this generation that can do that, uh, the same kind of people that will let their kids starve in the corner while they play video games, these things are not, there's not really much precedent for that kind of thing. You know, we have, <laughs> that I've ever heard, I mean, I've, I've heard some things in my life, but I've I've only been alive since 1966, so... This is late in, in the human experience here. And the Bible's clear that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of pleasure more than God. And, and when you've got people that are willing to do that, I mean, I mean, just you could just list the stuff that is going on even legally in this country. We've got no room in the prison and no money to pay for it, so we just say, well, we'll just legalize marijuana. You know, in my time, they called it dope because it made you stupid. You know, you, you didn't have any volition. You know, the homeless population is mostly people that have given over to drugs or alcohol in some way 
to get some kind of buzz and, and complete absolutely 180 degree contradiction to the Bible. So what does that tell you when you take the Bible out of people and away from people, you end up with lots of broken, you know, refuse laying on the street. I've been back to my, I'm in Oklahoma now, but I've been back to my, my home in California and there were blocks of tents. I mean, it used to be there was Skid Row, right? We all kind of knew about Skid Row. Skid Row, you, you came to a screeching, grinding halt and you're lined up with the rest of them that did drugs, that said yes to the Kool-Aid of drugs and alcohol to try to, you know, just have fun and, and somehow it's like cool, you know, that this movie that came out, Crocodile Dundee, where this guy is some kind of virtuous, you know, crocodile hunter compared to us city dwellers. And really he is because the way they portray the character. You know, we're condemning him for shooting crocodiles for hides or something like he's a poacher and yet we go to the city and he's approached by prostitutes. He's taken to a party where it's cool to just be snorting cocaine and and everyone's dressed like a whore and dancing around. You got transvestites and he's like, are you a man or a woman? And it's just comedy. But, you know, it's really a picture of how vile and we just accept it and we think we're doing something good by saying oh you know you're okay I'm okay as long as we can make money and eat and so uh, we don't you know, even our uh, in our founding fathers the, the document the Co Constitution Article, Article 6 uh, forbids a religious test upon government servants you don't have to believe in the Lord to serve in the government in the United States, it should be an abomination. And yet, why did that occur? Is because of the schisms within the church. You've got all kinds of different denominations, and so the real fear was that one denomination would rise. Like suddenly, the Catholics would be in power, and they'd be telling us we'd have to, you know, honor the Pope or something. And and they didn't want that religious falsehood to get in so they they threw the baby out with the bathwater to say you don't need to serve the Lord before you it's, just, it's not even a requirement I mean that is just insanity you don't have to believe in Jesus Christ and God to be a governor to be a judge to be a school teacher we are insane to, to believe that and to practice that and we honor these fools that because they couldn't they didn't even know the truth and we say oh the, the founding fathers were Christians they weren't much Christian to say something like that to give us over to whatever in government and JFK there he is the apex predator okay Mr. Pretty with his pretty face and his pretty wife just having sex with everything that come down the pike and we all say oh it's a conspiracy theory and oh I met this this guy he was the father of my girlfriend in high school when I was a fool and living in sin too and he was just oh when JFK died we were so oh it's like all our hopes were dashed <laughs> you know and I was kind of like, I was marveling at this. I, I didn't really fully understand uh, what I know now about that. But I, I, I kind of, I didn't, I don't think I was quite, you know, obviously as moved as he was having, he lived through that time. And, you know, they're portraying this idyllic thing with Camelot and all this stuff. Now, Camelot is not even a good story. I mean, it's about adultery. I mean, what, where did we lose that message? And so, Lee Harvey Oswald, right? The one of our best soldiers, you know, a Marine, <laughs> can shoot straight. 
And God has made all things for himself, even the wicked, for the day of evil. So this wicked man that could shoot, shot straight, and he took him out. And I, I'm not joking or happy. I don't think there's joy in my face as I'm relating this thing to you. But we've got to, and look at Mr. Trump with his long list of errors and sins and abuses and stealing money from people and he starts a school and nobody cares what he's done in the past and sure enough he goes to Ukraine and says hey you give me some dirt on Joe or I won't give you money and they need money I mean my goodness here come the Russians running right over them and now we're paying through the nose you know your chickens come home to roost I mean even Joe Biden says oh if you're not you don't vote for me, you're not really black. <laughs> Can you imagine this guy? And and Haiti, <laughs> there's nothing but black people. I guess you have to be the right kind of black for him or something. But they say, hey, our, 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 we're torn up with Cat 5 hurricanes the last however many years. We can't even count them. <laughs> I mean, this stuff is preposterous, really. And for the first time, I think, in my life, some nation is asking us actually to come intervene in their business, right? Haiti says, hey, our, our president's been assassinated. <laughs> the, the mobs are in the street. The gangs are taken over. Would you come and help us and just help restore order and give us some money and help us build some buildings that don't fall down when the wind blows? And Joe Biden, he's just in office, he's already exhausted, okay. He's sitting in a chair. He's not even standing up to answer the question. He says, no, we're, we're not going to do anything. I mean. And so, the next month, you have Haitians now, not Mexicans, <laughs> black-skinned, Haitians crossing the border being rounded up like cattle by cowboy looking United States border agents it's just the biggest scumbag joke and Emma Lazarus is rolling in her grave <laughs> and what does he do and here come all the Latin American countries that are falling down because they get a little money and they get corrupt because they don't have God. They got Roman Catholicism, okay? They got Mother Mary and they got the rosary beads and they got priests that are told they can't marry and they screw around with boys because no man should be told that by another man. But we don't know the Bible. We just accept, oh, he's got a robe, he's got a hat, he's got, you know, this or that. Why? Because we're so busy, you know, taking the stones out of our cornfield, and we're so tired, and we can't even read the Bible for ourselves. And what's the answer of America, you know, to this this idea that, you know, even the church doesn't have the truth like it should. So what happens when the foundation is destroyed? What can the righteous do? Well, I'll tell you, it's relay the foundation, okay? So we've got to go back and relay it. So what is the foundation? The Bible said it. There's no other foundation that can be laid than what is already laid. And you did not lay it. I did not lay it. God laid it. Jesus Christ crucified for you and me. That's it. That is the foundation of our life. And if it is not, we are on our way to a devil's hell and to the lake of fire. And you will be totally destroyed forever. And you will be suffering. I mean, you're going to be alive in that lake of fire. And I, I know a guy. He, his name was Elmer Steele. When I met him, he was 82. And he said he was dipped in the lake of fire by God for 16 seconds. He had been the driver for Pretty Boy Floyd, if any of you know who that is. 
and he had inside information. He said they would call him Chalk Floyd because his habit was he'd kill people and throw them in a chalk barrel. It was like a, a barrel they used for pickling or something. And he, that was his nickname, was Chalk Floyd, <laughs> which should put terror in the hearts of his enemies, right? You want to end up in a chalk barrel, you know, then mess with pretty boy Floyd. And so, <laughs> stupid. But anyway, Elmer's like a welder, right? And he works with his hands, and so he drives the car, and he welds bulletproof armor for the getaway car, right? Because I guess, I don't know if, if Bonnie and Clyde predated them or something, but Bonnie and Clyde caught a lot of bullets, right? And Pretty Boy Floyd had you know, sense enough to... But anyway, so Elmer, uh, in a getaway, shoots a police officer. And the police officer, uh, after a few days, he dies in the hospital. Elmer is convicted and put on death row. So he's telling me this story, and he fasted for 30 days in the prison because he come up against it. I mean, he was at his end and, you know, brought low. Okay, he'd been flying high, maybe even feeling justified. Well, they're, they're foreclosing on the farm, so we're just going to, you know, just kill them all, let God sort them out was kind of the attitude because they feel like the banks are just cold-blooded. Maybe they were. But that doesn't, you know, we, we're not to be, you know, taking vengeance. God takes vengeance. But anyway, so he's praying and fasting and on death row. And the report comes back that the police officer died of heart problems. And so on this technicality, he gets to slide. But in the interim, during this fasting and repenting, God took him to the lake of fire and dipped him in it for 16 seconds, he said. And he said it felt like millions of volts of electricity going through his body constantly, which should be consistent with the biblical testimony that they will have no rest, day or night, that worship the beast and take the mark of his name. So you may have done that already spiritually by denying the Lord and loving money and preferring sin. And if you've done that, the good news is the real Antichrist hasn't come yet, but he is on the way, which leads me into the message for today. All this is foundational to show you the condition we're in because of the absence of truth and even the schisms in the church and the division. So Elmer is let out on this technicality, which was just the pure grace of God, and then he got to live to be about 90 or so. But the point is to let you know there is a lake of fire. He was there. He was witness to it. He said to God, why did you do that to me? It was if, you know, it was if, you know, he hadn't killed somebody. It wasn't that repentant, I guess. But, you know, I guess if you are, you suffer like that, you it's probably kind of a mind-blowing experience, I would imagine. So you can cut him a little slack for asking, <laughs> I guess. But it kind of shows maybe he wasn't as sorry as he could have been. But anyway, which that's another story. <laughs> but I, I did, um, he did say that God said to him, well, if you spent 40 years building something and I tore it up, wouldn't you be mad? <laughs> so, you know, God's a person and he will deal with you. So the good news is, okay, like this, say, the Antichrist is close I, and I can show you. Okay, and let's get into it just because that's why I'm sitting here. Because this is not 1966. This is not 1887. This is 2022. And I'll tell you what, from what I can see, we're in the end. Not just the beginning of sorrows with earthquakes and famines and, and pestilences and all the stuff we've seen from, you know, about, you know, since I've been alive, there's been plenty of earthquakes. I mean, we really haven't heard many earthquakes lately because not really at all because of this. I believe there's a transition taking place right now. When you see Daniel 7, 5, which says, let me read it to you because... There, there was a preacher in Oklahoma named Kenneth Hagin Jr. that says, read it to him. 
you know, read him. Read him. He was talking about his wife and your wife. So read the Bible to her. I mean, that's what a husband's supposed to be able to do. You're supposed to be able to answer your wife's questions from the Word of God and not just wait for the minister all the time. In fact, uh, women aren't really supposed to, you know, yell out in church, well, what does that mean, preacher? <laughs> They're supposed to ask their husbands at home. Now, if the husband doesn't know, I guess you better get the preacher involved. But, uh, you know, uh, the husband is supposed to teach his wife the word. And the wife should teach the children. And it's called, you know, I guess you could call that the trickle-down theory <laughs> that we should have. Instead of waiting for the money to drop, we should get the word of God in us from the top down. You know, and then we'll have the building set right. Amen. So Daniel chapter 7, just to let you know where we are and, and from what I can see. Now, the only disclaimer I give to this is that God is God. And God is the one himself, God the Father now, has said he has the times and seasons in his own power. It said even the Son doesn't know the time of his return and so forth. Now what Jesus knows now, I'm not sure but it may still be that way. I mean, Jesus has all power in heaven and earth, but God has reserved the timing for himself. But I believe the Bible teaches us, if we understand it properly, uh, even the time, even almost to the, you could even say to the day of Jesus' return, if you get this understanding. So go with me here. The hour is not known because Jesus said at an hour you think not the Son of Man is coming so that indicates what kind of hour would that be well it could be a time of great trouble it could be a time of great prosperity just depending on where you are in your life but either way the Lord is coming and so you need to be ready all right so Daniel 7 5 uh, well, let me give you a little bit of context here. So Daniel is having a dream during the reign of Belshazzar, who was a wicked king. And so God is showing him a dream to give him hope, you know, for the future. And Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So this is an indication of sort of a creative process. You know, when God made the earth, the earth was formless and void and there was darkness on the water. So God had destroyed the previous creation with a flood at that time. And the dinosaurs and whatever else should not be here while we're here because all, otherwise we'd be living underground or something uh, <laughs> or not living at all. So God had destroyed that creation with the flood. There's water all over the world, and then the wind, the Spirit of the Lord sort of moved upon the face of the waters, and there's this like stirring kind of thing. So this power, there's four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. So there's like this battle going on in heaven. There's the Spirit of God, and there's the prince of the power of the air, Satan. And Satan has a claim. He still say, well, they're still guilty. They're still sinners and they have not repented. So I have a right. And so God in his mercy and Satan, they're fighting, still striving. And God would like to have mercy, but the fact is the fact. There, there's got to be death for sin. And so here it comes. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So God doesn't do it like send lightning and destroy the whole earth in a moment, which he obviously could do. Even when Moses was with the children of Israel and they'd be evil or something and unbelieving and murmuring, you know, they were supposed to just have a little walk across the desert with some granola bars with for strength and a little water out of the rock and get them over there to take care of business. But they couldn't because they they lost the mission in, in the in the heat of the desert the uncomfortableness the they couldn't see their they didn't remember they lost faith like really quickly it's like you run out of gas and so that's why there's church you're supposed to get in church weekly and get refreshed and get encouraged and get planted and give the minister some money i mean the guy's working 
that's hard. You know, stand up there. You've got to stand in front of God, get the message. You've got to keep yourself from sin all week with all these girls dressed in their underwear today and stuff going on. It's just evil. And you got to stand up there and give a message from God. And it better be right because of God is a judge. And the, and the teachers get a stricter judgment. They're under the gun. So we, and I consider myself a minister because God has called me in this office as a prophet to tell you the truth about the end. And part of the testimony of the prophet is to tell you you need to repent of some stuff. All right, because there's stuff coming down the pipe that's deadly. I mean, go to Ukraine. You, you want to go to Ukraine and build a summer house? No, because, you know, there was a guy skiing. When, when the Russians, he's up on the mountain skiing, just living a careless life, you know, packing money into his bank account, raising his family, just like most Americans try to do. They dream, oh, yeah, I'd like to go skiing on vacation. And here's this guy's doing it. He's living the dream. And, and, and the day he's coming down the mountain slopes, you know, just carelessly skiing, having a grand old time, while there's civil war in his country going on, and the Russian speakers hate the Ukrainian speakers, and they can't come to the table probably because Vladimir Putin is just agitating to get enough unrest in there to have a justification to come. Okay, so it's all a setup, right? And this guy's just skiing along, spending his money, just living carelessly, not probably not serving God, but who knows? And I'm not judging that. But the fact is, when the war came, he was totally unprepared, except that he had some money. And so uh, he could probably have taken his family and moved him out. But his main concern was, how am I going to tell my daughter that we have to leave our house? That's his, that's his cry of his heart. I have to explain to my daughter why we have to leave home. Not much concern for anybody else, obviously. And what is he going to do anyway? I mean, if God has set the time, okay, and so... You know, we're talking about God here. God is God, and He is all-powerful. And, you know, the reason He brings it the way He does is because He gives you time. I mean, this is right here what I'm about to read was written around 500 B.C. Okay, that's uh, how many years ago is that now? We've got, uh, let's say, 2,500 roughly years ago. BC, for those of you who don't know what that is now, with all this stuff, we try to take the Lord out of our life. And BCE now is what you all think that BC means before Christ. And so we we count time in my generation that zero is uh, the the counts of when Jesus was born. When Jesus was born is zero thirty three A.D. is when he died. Anna Domini means the year of our Lord, basically where he is now risen. And so we reckon that everything from the time of his resurrection to now is a year of our Lord because he's conquered death. He's overcome sin. He won the victory on the cross for all of us. And by faith, we can just say, thank you, you know, accept that gift of salvation. And you're behind something called a shield of faith. <laughs> A shield of confidence and, and not in yourself not in your own goodness your own works your own even religious duty or whatever it's just the gift of God not of work salvation is a gift that's why Christmas not to blow up Christmas too much but to say it's just a token you know a tree with ornaments remembers a, a beautiful thing that was done on a cross of wood an ornament of grace Jesus Christ was the light of the world to hang there bloody and sacrificed and bleeding out and asphyxiated, very, a very uncomfortable beard pulled out, spit upon, hated. And all he ever did was heal the sick, raise the dead, and tell people they needed to repent because they're on their way to a devil's hell in this lake of fire where you're just going to buzz like a, like a moth gets caught in the wiring, you know. And that's going to be you. If you don't believe this gospel, well, the gospel is good news that Jesus paid <clears throat> for our sins. So just hear that and believe it and receive it. And then <clears throat> out of that, <clears throat> out of that belief, let some action proceed. 
We talked about Peter earlier, how he denied the Lord. And he's standing in front of 5,000 guys that 90 days before had said, crucify Jesus. Just a mob. And they had 90 days to kind of cool down. You know, right? The guys that trample people in the soccer place are probably normally somewhat decent individuals, but they get frothing and and crazy about a stupid soccer game and, and trample their neighbors. <laughs> I mean, this is just a crazy world we live in. But, you know, it's people that are stupid, evil, and get worked up about nothing. I mean, a soccer game, really? Uh, come on. Now, these guys were not much better, but they have a little better excuse, okay, for being knuckleheads because they were fed this from their youth, okay? The Jewish religion is where it's at, and it was even the Old Covenant. And if uh, we don't listen to these guys, then we're going to go to hell too. And so they, they bought it. They had already bought it. And Jesus came, and they didn't know it was him because the religious leaders had kind of kept the law to themselves. They really hadn't taught it. They'd been in actually not been very good guys. It's kind of like the Catholic experiment where they just vested all the understanding of whatever they believed in the priesthood and then they're set apart. Like there's this cast of people that, you know, should know. And so it comes all the way up to this guy in a fancy hat that's now they say he's infallible, which is absolutely ridiculous because no man is infallible. And we know that. But they want to create something that so I can just go drink and I can go carouse and I can go live my own life and let it be his job. He's going to stand there and talk to God so that we can all live and just be like little ants, you know, eating and drinking and playing and and let him, it's his job, and maybe once in a while I'll, you know, go and make a confession. And So we, we don't want to talk to God because we don't, we just don't have time. We don't, we don't want to bother with that because, hey, hey, I've got, I've got, uh, you know, a football game to go to. I've got uh, this to do. I've got that to do. So God becomes, you know, something that there, it's their job. Even in the churches now that we call spiritual or correct or we're not like the Catholics that you know and when we read about what happens and I can explain to you why the Catholic Church has, has suffered like it has it's in the Bible first Timothy chapter 4 you know they forbid to marry you're not supposed to do that a man is gifted by God to marry or not to marry not by some artificial flavoring you don't tell a man well, you can have a fancy hat if you want, you know, marry. And then he's chasing boys and nuns because he, he's not gifted that way. And that's what I call artificial flavor. You've messed it up. You've corrupted it. And now you have to somehow make it, you know, he's infallible. <laughs> so don't even question. <laughs> I mean, that's just, it's not American for one thing. America was founded on the idea, well, uh, we're set free by the Lord Jesus to judge righteously. So we're going to, if we get together as a bunch of righteous people that love the Lord, we're going to make the better choice because in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. So these biblical foundational principles are there, but do we, did we do it quite right? No, we didn't because we have omitted a religious we've made it not necessary to be a Christian even to serve in the government how are you going to have righteous government without righteous people righteousness is not something you have without Christ Christ is our righteousness the Bible said righteousness is a gift God gives you his righteousness in exchange for your sinful nature that we are all born with and, and the problem is people won't accept that they think, oh, I'm good to this puppy dog, therefore I'm a righteous person. I care whether or not the, the spotted owl has a home and whether there's trees in the woods. So, therefore, you know, I, I don't eat meat because I'm so much better than you. You're so mean, you'll eat a cow. And, and that becomes our, our measuring stick by which we judge, oh, I'm a good person. You know, 
as you get up from your slimy bed with your slimy boyfriend that doesn't even have a job and won't get one and, and you don't care because you're working and you can provide and you know and, and then you know one day he just decides to go off with someone else and you decide well I'll just get me a girlfriend because we don't have any sense of what's right and wrong and, and we've lost the power to judge righteously and so the country was founded on this idea that we're going to believe in that men that are saved and Christian have power to judge right and who is this king to you know put in positions on us that's overbearing and he's not aware he's not on the ground over here knowing how tough it is to make a living here and they want so much from us and you know on the flip side of that the American people that were here the colonists had been saved by blood by the British Empire the British came and fought the French and the Indians with us they fought them they died men of and they paid money and so there was a debt and it was not forgiven so that's why they were you know kind of insistent in part you know when you get in bed with someone like that and you and they die and sons of theirs are killed fighting for your independence and freedom and power to keep you know making your own money and whatever well we weren't able to negotiate that and the king is painted as an insane person or something and maybe he was but the point is we have problems in this world and God and Jesus are the way to peace the way of peace would have been to say send some ambassadors and meet up maybe in a neutral location and talk it out and say look man you guys need to come here and see how it really is before you start levying all this tax you just want to get rich on our backs we're not having it and there had to be some but for whatever reason there wasn't and so you had hundreds of thousands of people killing each other that their heritage was actually to be brothers you know Ephraim is Great Britain the son of Joseph the younger son when Jacob crossed his hands and he took his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim and Joseph was like no no no, no. that that's not right you should put your right hand on him. this is the firstborn and Jacob said no no because he did it on purpose because God was showing him in the cross there's going to be the birth of these great people so Ephraim was to be a company of nations. Well, history tells us that at a certain time, the sun never set on the British Empire because there was some country that was under British rule. What was the effect of that? Well, the good effect was that a lot of people speak English now, whereby they might be, under, be able to understand easily what I'm saying, that Jesus Christ died for their sins. That was the point, just like Alexander the Great. If you read in the Bible, even in the book of Daniel, of the, the he-goat, Alexander the Great was given to just, like lightning, conquer most of the civilized world except for the Far East. But he conquered much of uh, what we consider the West now and the Middle East and so forth. In a lightning stroke, I mean, he'd only lived to be 33. But the thing about Alexander the Great is he was Greek, and he liked Greek culture. He thought it was so good that everybody should be what they called Hellenized, which is made to know Greek language and custom. And, and what happened on the heels of that was that the New Testament was given in Greek. Isn't God good? He's smart. And he his will is that nobody perish. And so uh, you know, Paul the Apostle spoke Greek among other things and he was able then to write letters in Greek and a lot of the known world at that time spoke Greek even Alexandria and places like that so the same thing happened uh, with the British Empire so they went around the world and they subdued a lot of it they were a naval power and they dominated the seas they knew how to build ships that were lighter and faster and could you know travel and be quicker and more nimble in battle the British uh, 
were known to be a, sort of a disciplined people and they just they had that ability and they were actually descended from the Vikings uh, uh, to some extent that these guys were just sold out they were not there was no looking back there was nothing to look back to they come from a frozen wasteland and they just said we better go get some and they just started sailing around taking whatever they wanted well then they got civilized and they sat down in that kind of just we don't care we're going to do it our way went forward and unfortunately um, they weren't much good at, at the gospel and so if we read here in the book of Daniel this is actually talking about um, at first you might think it's talking about Babylon but the four beasts here the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings okay to me that's Great Britain you know, Great Britain has this image of a lion that's kind of their thing and eagle's wings and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it <laughs> so to me that's England and the United States because when the wings were plucked and they quit running around the world and they just kind of the main colony became America and a man's heart was given to it this fulfills the word of the Lord to Joseph through Jacob when he said Joseph will be a fruitful branch that reaches over the wall so this lion like beast that just went around and said you're going to do it our way subdued gigant I mean India was a gigantic nation and yet they were under the British boot for a long time because of wisdom technology the blessing of God on Ephraim from Joseph to have dominion and the point was really to give them the gospel but you know they they were more it seemed like they were more interested in feeling the need to just subjugate people for a season and I can't say it wasn't from God you know maybe those people needed to be kind of forcibly civilized and made to speak English where if you go to India now it, a lot of people speak English and so it's easier now to reach them for Jesus Christ because of that because a man's heart given to it the United States has a, a, a reputation at least in the in the recent past of being somewhat of a compassionate nation I think that is changing unfortunately okay and so that is in place we've got uh, Britain and America typically is looked to as the leaders of the free world because of the blessing of God through Joseph upon Ephraim and Manasseh and now to us through Jesus Christ and Joseph was virtuous and he didn't sleep with Potiphar's wife and all that good stuff and so he came forward and his legacy is with us to do that now John F Kennedy was the opposite you know instead of being virtuous he was vile and received for the wrong that he's done um, and we've seen that you know where it's ugly uh, Bill Clinton other people that were gifted intelligent uh, charismatic you know had some wisdom even from the Lord to do good and yet their character has brought them low to where when you say Bill Clinton you think of something bad instead of good and that's not what you want young person you don't want to have to be Judge Kavanaugh you know swollen water like you're in hell already and your your stuff is all in the breeze you know you don't do it just don't go to the party there's nothing there but drunkards and whorish women and even good people that are just letting their hair down when they shouldn't be. The only time you let your hair down, lady, is when you're in your bedroom with your husband. That's it. That's the only time to be doing that. And if you do it any other time, you're a fornicator and you're going to hell. So you better just quit. And if you've done it and you're alive hearing this, the, the way is made. If you confess your sins, First John 1, 9, the Lord is faithful and just. And why would he be just to forgive you? Because if your faith in the suffering, pining, agonizing death of Jesus for you, and if you put faith in that, God says you're guiltless now. You're washed in the blood of Christ, and you can be baptized in water. That's action that proceeds from that belief, and it's an open, living, 
hey, I'm a Christian and kill me if you want. And there was a time when they did, and some places they do. So that's why it's important to be baptized openly to say, look, I'm Christian. You're confessing Jesus Christ's death before man that you needed it. Okay, that's what you're saying. You're you're not that good. Look, you're in a fornication relationship. You're on your way to hell. That's not good. No bueno. Okay, homosexual, you're an abomination to God. And you, what you're doing is an abomination. And you need to just admit it. Okay, and not just admit it. But come to the altar and say, Lord, forgive me of this sin. And in doing that, you meet the terms of the new covenant whereby God's grace is extended to you. With him there is forgiveness that he may be respected, feared, regarded. Hey, he's the way. I might, you know, and then I have to decide, do I love my little married to a man, boyfriend, whatever I've got, and all this esteem and praise I get of man. Oh, yes, we're full of gay pride and, and we're stupid, but aren't we just wonderful out here, you know, in our handcuffs and all this crap that they parade? You know, I mean, and and what what are we doing? We're, we're insane. It is absolute insanity in the light of God's truth for Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodomy, the word sodomy comes from Sodom. Have you ever read about Sodom? It was, it was burned not from a nuclear bomb, but from God's own anger. His fire came down from heaven and absolutely incinerated that city. And he can do that. You don't think God can... I mean, you ever been hit by lightning? If that bolt's big enough, it'll burn you smooth to nothing. And, you know, he God's powerful. You know, anything, anything that's got power comes from God's power. You know, would you stand in front of a bus? That thing is powerful, and it'll flatten you. And, you know, God uses the example of a great white shark. He said, I made that thing. You, you, you'd be scared just looking at it, and you're going to stand in front of me? with your little haughty, you know, half-naked butt floating down, you know, Madison Avenue with your gay lover and your rainbows wrapped around you, you're not going to make it, man. You better repent. And you can. That's, see, this is the good news. God in his grace will call you on your stuff to say, look, I'm telling you this for your good. Okay, you're a mess. But I died a bloody mess so that you could be forgiven. Not just forgiven, but cleansed cleansed where you won't have that proclivity and you that enslaved you right now you're you're a slave to sin you've got to go do that you don't have a choice right now except to hear this repent and this is what peter preached to those five thousand murderers peter didn't have a gun by the way now they had whipped jesus they had torn out his beard they kicked him and beat him and beat him up and did all kinds of horrible things to him and crucified him dead on a on a pole, okay, on a cross. Peter knew that. And he wasn't going to be different because Jesus said, if they do this to me, how much more are they going to do to you? You're not as good as me. They're going to do worse to you. So... Because, you know, we know Jesus was Jesus, but Peter, who are you? You know, you're just some guy, fisherman, telling me to repent. And, you know, we saw what they did to Stephen in Acts chapter 7, just stoned him smooth out without no fear at all. And these people will play video games with their kids rot in a corner. They'll have sex, fornicating sex, and, and and lobby like crazy people that we want to be have freedom to kill our children and our whims. Oh, my Lord, we are a long way gone, people. And there's one way back. Oh, Lord, man, I am a hot mess. I need to repent. Well, what's repent means I'm sorry. I, oh, Jesus, I, I mean, God is a killer. God is, if God decides your day has come your day is about come except for one thing prayer somebody's praying for you and I'll tell you if somebody's praying for you then Jesus is praying for you if they're Christian and that's not power to presume I'll just go on long and one day I'll just have this you know miraculous I'll just wait on I'll just keep doing wrong 
Now, if you're hearing this, let's stop and drop and pray. Let's say, Father God, I have sinned. I'm vile. I'm unclean, Lord. Unclean, Lord. Forgive me my unclean way. Lord, if you can still do something, deliver me, save me, cleanse me from this unrighteousness, this vile way of mine that I've learned from my youth since the 80s up to now, you know, or whatever, the 70s, 80s, you know. As you look in verse 10 here, and 9, I beheld till thrones were cast down, Daniel 7, 9, and the Ancient of Days did sit. This is God the Father sitting, and whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as a burning fire. So God's like an old man in a wheelchair looking at you, and he's just on fire. He's so powerful and angry at your sin. And this is coming. This is this is written right here. I beheld till thrones were cast down. So this is after all these beasts go, and all their thrones are cast down, as Jesus is done ruling. And this is more of the story. I'm kind of still stuck in this repentance thing because you know we're we've got a lot of sin in this world and in people's hearts, and we're just so proud of it. I mean. Our little heroes, Ben Affleck and J-Lo, get married and all she can do is use it as a strip tease. I mean, everything, she, picture of hers with her boobs hanging out. And we, and this is our new Camelot people. <laughs> well, be careful. Someone's going to catch a bullet or a tumor or something like that. Because the Lord's a judge. And man cannot abide in his pomp, but is like the beasts that perish. We've got to repent. We've got to turn from our sin and get back to the Lord. Well, how do you do that? You've got to agree that what you're doing is wrong. Lord, forgive me. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Cleanse me from my unrighteousness so that if I judge myself now, I'll not be judged. That's good news. But when I'm a vile homosexual, abominable in the sight of God if I disagree well that's what I am Lord now forgive me Lord Jesus thank you for dying for me well I now I'm moving in the right direction I'm moving towards salvation I'm I'm gonna start working out my own salvation with fear and trembling with the Holy Ghost to help me I need the Holy Ghost to help me and that's what Peter preached to those 5,000 Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children as many as are near and afar off as many as the Lord our God shall call. So if you're being called, the Lord is saying, hey, repent now. Admit it. Admit your sin. Confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now that part of it is going to take time. You've got to have your mind renewed. So those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. That means you've got to do the diligence. You know, if you were going to try to quit smoking, you would go to the doctor and get your patches or whatever, and you'd be diligent. If you were going to go, like you people that are getting off heroin, you, you're diligent about getting your methadone. I mean, it's not the best way, but it's a stair-step thing. But if you miss, then you suffer. Well, there's a better way. You come to the Lord's house, where the church is, the, the one near you, not Catholic, but Christian, a Christian church where they believe in the Holy Spirit. And they believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because you, Jesus... Uh, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me whom you do not know. And some of you think you know Jesus. Oh, he's just that nice, sweet shepherd that's just going to coddle me and always tell me it's okay. 
No, it's not okay. The blood of Christ doesn't work until you repent. When you repent, it works, and it always does, because if you repent with godly sorrow, you're really sorry for your sin, and you want to change, and you want to be cleansed, and you want with all your heart to be right with God and get on the path and narrow way. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. I mean, the main reason being, they're not seeking. Now, if you seek, you will find. If you knock, it'll be open to you. This book is still here. And it's not that expensive. You can go get one for 10 bucks. Brand new one. With big print and everything. And God has made it available. His, his truth endures to all generations. It said, well, what are you waiting for? You know, you're waiting to go, you can't wait to go buy a pack of cigarettes or, or alcohol that's killing you. You know it's killing you. You killed your father, you killed your mother, you killed your neighbor. And killed your friends and all you, oh, my friend, all you just love to get on Facebook and say, oh, my friend died, send us money so we can bury him because I was too stupid to even have money for my family when they die. And so I got to stand on a street corner, look like an idiot because I don't even have nothing prepared for my family because I don't know the Lord. I don't know the word of God. And I know I'm supposed to at least have something if my family can bury me. Because I'm going to live forever. Nothing can happen to me. I'm me. I'm the head me. You know, it's just dumb. So we have to realize that we don't know everything. Probably not much nothing. So here's this fiery flame and his wheels is burning fire. And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him thousand thousands ministered to him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him the judgment was set and the books were opened every word you said every idle word you said is there in the book and there ain't no place to hide man and I beheld okay and Daniel is seeing this stuff ahead of time to tell you and me hey there is a day appointed. It is appointed once to die, and after this, the judgment to mankind. You do not get out of it. I don't care what Arnold Schwarzenegger says. It, it's coming, brother and sister. And so the best thing to do is to get judged now. Judge yourself, and you'll not be judged. That's the way of escape. Take it. Come on, take it. Jesus Christ died for you. Repent, be baptized in his name, you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All that that would have been in that book to be read in front of you would be wiped away in the blood. And what's more is you'll get power to become a new person, a new creation even, that you don't want to sin no more. You don't wake up in the morning chasing a bottle or some hoe. You are looking after God and what is his will and what is his plan and what is his desire for me today. What is the plan today? Well, hallelujah. I've got an itinerary and it isn't even of my own. It's God's doing. God. Because Ephesians 2 said, you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that you should walk in them. So you're on the broad way, serving the devil and sin and lust, leading to destruction, eating the apple every day. Oh, give me some more. Oh, give me some more. Oh, give me some more. Eating that evil until it's just coming out of your ears and your mouth and your eyeballs and you're wrapped in a rainbow half naked on a public street with your boyfriend. I mean, come on, man. And then you just recognize, well, that's... I would say that's not what I probably set out to do when I was seven. Okay, when I was seven, I wanted to be a fireman. I wanted to drive a truck. I wanted to run a dump truck or something. Or, you know, I wanted to be a, you know, whatever. Something like what a little boy might think about. And now I'm over here <laughs> in my glittering <laughs> rainbow with my bondage boyfriend or my husband or whatever you know come on man 
How did that happen? Well, the Bible says sin is like a mystery. It just kind of comes on it. You know, you have it in you. And then the environment you're in, you know, the people around you, uh, the things you're exposed to mold and make you and shape you. So the call is to come to me, Jesus said. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What are you laboring? And you're laboring to try to make yourself good. I'm a good person, and you're always having to defend that to where now you're part of the gay pride movement. We have to defend the faith of the gay and say, well, everybody that hates us is, is a hater. Well, we hate what you're doing, and we tell you so that you miss out on this fiery stream that's going to burn you to a crispy critter, and you'll be a skeleton being eaten of worms in a fire that doesn't ever go out. I mean, this stuff is in the Bible, and it it's the same God that said you'll surely die. It's the same God that said the sun will come up, that there will be cold and heat, and you like all that, but you don't like the rest of it. Well, you got to keep reading. See, if you continue in my word, Jesus said, in that way, you'll be made my disciple. You know the truth. The truth will make you free. Well, you better get on board and get started because getting started is not getting finished in every case. Okay, Sometimes people, they repent and they die. But a lot of times you're left here and you've got to work it out because God wants to get some use out of you. He's, you know, you served the devil and built his kingdom. Well, now you got to turn around and serve the Lord and build his kingdom. And the way you do that is by what I'm doing right here. You just learn the word and you share it. Now, let me, I build this as a an end time thing. Well, we're talking about the end time because we're living in a time and I'm describing to you the time that we're in and, and the context and the misunderstanding and the lack of understanding about why President Kennedy is dead, why Martin Luther King even is dead. He was a Baptist, not full of the Holy Ghost, didn't have power to push back against all that attention he was getting. And from what I've heard, I, I don't really know if he was that way. I've heard things. So I don't really know about him. I, I mean, I, it's clear that John F. Kennedy was a flander. There's lots of testimony. Martin Luther King's has been kind of, it's come to some light, but I, I really, the sources of it are not as reliable and I, maybe that's of the Lord to kind of protect his legacy you know because what he did publicly was a great thing and very Christ-like to be nonviolent and just procure for his people a great deliverance that should have happened in 1865 where everyone said okay we fought to free you now we're going to make you equal brothers and come on to church come on to school come on uh, you know marry my daughter I mean we, we don't we're not right about that, and we had never been right, and we're still not right about it, a lot of us. So we don't look on the outward. We're supposed to, God looks on the heart. Well, you don't judge after the flesh. You're supposed to judge a way a person comes to you. How are, what's their character like? You don't do a job interview, and they come in, they're black, and you say, done. You say, no. You start listening to them, their qualifications, their, how they present. Is this a good fit for my company, the way they the understanding they have, the way they communicate, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and the comportment, and these things are to be judged, not the, just the color, the outward appearance. If you're doing that, you're vain and stupid, and you're missing it, and you're not bringing people in, you're keeping people out, and they'll be the ones whose kids have guns and shoot their neighbors because you're frustrated because you don't give them the opportunity they're supposed to have as a human being. We've done that for a hundred years past the time they should have been equal under the law and, and we're paying every day and they're paying too because they've been denied and you say oh they haven't been hell we, we didn't read no history book you're just blind and stupid like you'd rather be now there is a history behind the black experience that is a bad history and they're the origin, the origins of the black people is disadvantaged because of the father of the black people was a man named Cush who was the son of a man who was a rebel. And that's a long story and the, the long and short of it is rebellions as the sin of witchcraft. And so 
people today, if you're a black person and you do evil and you are evil, not because you're black, but because you're evil, you, you'd rather shoot somebody than go get a job because you don't like the job that you can get. Okay, the job you can get is, uh, well, what's an example? Uh, I've seen a lot of black people that drive a bus. Are you glad that the bus driver shows up, stops, is courteous, gets out, makes sure your wheelchair gets strapped in good and gets back in the seat and drives you where you're supposed to go? Do you care whether he's black or white? No, you care that the bus gets where it's supposed to go safe. And a lot of them do it. Now, why is a black man a bus driver and not a white man? Because that's what they can get sometimes. They don't they don't get the opportunity to, to be welcomed into the big circle of the oil fields and the higher up stuff that the white people got. How the white people get it? Because they were Christian first. And that's it. They were Christian first, so they're blessed ahead of them. And that, that's just the way it is. It's not because uh, they're black or white so much as that the white people got Jesus first. They did. They're descended from Shem. Shem is Shemite. The Semites were given the laws of God, Israel. And however that went, where those people are more descended into Europeans and, and Americans and through Joseph and all that lineage, is blessed. It is blessed. And you don't have to apologize for it, but you do need to carry it properly. And so when you see someone coming to you, even in chains, or black people are dragged from savagery into civilization against their will, perhaps, but they just didn't know that they could come. They're in Africa in the darkness with their earlobes dragging on the ground, trying to, you know, keep from being killed by the other tribes in the area because they don't have Jesus. And it's a fact. They're not Christians over there. They weren't at that time. And to go in there was meant pretty much certain death. So, and not a good death. You know, being eaten or cooked or, you know, tortured and killed for some sport. You know, that savage is savage. It's what it is. You might as well own it, black people, and say you come from that. Uh, many of your ancestors were that. And so where did that come from? It come from darkness. Darkness, it, Ham was evil. He said, uh, look, ha, 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 look, daddy's naked in the tent. Brothers, let's subvert the whole thing and we'll take over because he's a drunk and he's naked. And not taking into consideration, he's first, he's old. Second, he's been through a lot. And maybe he just can't sleep and they don't have NyQuil. So he just drank some wine to go to bed. And his blanket came off. What are you doing snooping around in his tent, fool? And that's disrespectful. And Noah woke up and knew because God showed him. And he said, hmm, okay, cursed be Canaan. So he cursed Canaan, who was like the third born. But God says, no, uh, everyone gets for their own sin. And so Ham was cursed right on down the line from himself on down. Ham has a bad name. And Cush was his firstborn. Cush means black, meaning his kid came out dark skin. And so those descendants have had it rough. And the response of Christian people to hearing that people are under a curse and need salvation should be that they need salvation, not that they need to be kept, you know, separate, that they should be brought in, you know. And we're doing that still from the president on down, telling the Haitians no, and then God sticks them right up our southern border, you know, no pun intended, but pun aware that you need to still stick it right up your wazoo, and you better deal with it then, and we didn't. We just round them up like cattle and treated them like crap because that's who we are now. We're just a bunch of money-loving, fence-putting up fools instead of reaching over the wall. Now we're trying to keep everybody out so they can't take our money and rape our daughters that we let dress like whores everywhere because we're, we're, we're the good people. And the Twin Towers had something else to say about that. You think God wasn't watching? To do that, God's good at stuff. You can knock your building down if need be. And he prayed for two weeks, go back to J Lo stripping in front of you and grabbing her crotch like Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson couldn't go to sleep, and he was killed by his own doctor trying to help him. The doctor just, well, 
don't know, I'd just give you this, and maybe that'll help. Try to help the guy. That's all that was left, and he's dead. And, and J-Lo gets up there and grabs her crotch and says, hey, I'm a woman, I can hear me roar. Eh, you idiot. Did you not see what happened to that poor kid? It, they taught him to sing love songs when he was five. What is a bunch of, what kind of parenting is that? Or John Benet Ramsey, they dress their little daughter like a dang beauty queen and expect some guy's not gonna rape and murder. There's knuckleheads, there's wickedness out there. Why are you gonna fan the flame, you dumb idiot? Why don't you just keep her on the download as you can grow up and defend herself from somebody by saying, no, no, I'm not coming with you, you tattooed nose ring jerk that can't even shower or care about anything but your dumb self and vanity and just trying to show your muscles like you're something. Driving a motorcycle 70, 70 miles an hour with me on the back. Is that love? That's stupid. Oh, I'm so sexy and I'm free and fearless. You're just stupid. And so what do we do? We say, yes, Lord, I'm stupid. You know, here I am in the hospital now with all my road, road rash. <laughs> and then all they do is they get better and go to the bar and tell everyone, oh, what a hero. What an idiot. I can't stand it. I see these guys riding on a motorcycle with their five-year-old <laughs> hanging on for dear life. <laughs> oh, it's just comedy. It's tragic comedy. And my dad was a neurosurgeon. He took he took me to the hospital one day. And I seen this guy. Most of his hair gone. And he was just like, you know, he was there, but he wasn't there. And he said, this guy, he said, if you ever ride a motorcycle, I'll disown you. Well, I've, I've seen that. You know, I know a pastor lost his leg on a motorcycle, and everyone's got a story, and everyone, we all go, oh, what a cool, tough guy. It's stupid, really. I mean, would you imagine going down the road at night and some, you know, dragonfly hits you in the face, and you're dead. You're dead. Some dog runs out, and you're trying to save the dog, and you're dead. Some rock in the road you can't see because you blinked your eye, you're dead. Why? So you can save on gas? I don't know. That would be the only reason I could see to ride one of them things. But if you ain't got no faith, get some faith. You know, put five bucks in the offering. Maybe God will give you faith to put gas in your tank, no matter how much it costs. Or just walk, take the bus. The black guy you hate that gets the bus there on time. Why don't you just get on the bus, fool? You know, <laughs> we're not very smart when you get right down to it. Smoking cigarettes. <sighs> you know that stuff coming out of the chimney, you put it right in your lungs. That, that, that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, the guy's going, don't smoke. And you're like, well, give me another one. I'm nervous now. <laughs> I work four hours. I have to sit down and blaze up because I... You know, we're, we're just not right. But see, the Lord doesn't leave us that way because he, he gives us a preacher, gives us free church. Now, do you ever have to pay? Anybody ever paid to go to church? You, like, have to pay at the door? You don't have to pay. You don't have to pay. That there's, there's a reason for that. There's no dues in the Christian church because God wants you saved and he makes it easy. You just walk in there. And if they throw you out because you're dirty, well, that's wrong, but maybe you could do something about it. Why don't you go to the day center where it's free and take a shower and clean yourself up so you don't make it so hard on them. You can do your part. You know, oh, they're judgmental. Well, maybe they, it's good for you to, that you go take a bath that's free. Too lazy. You just want to lay there until someone throws money at you. And how'd you get that way? It's worth a look. So, you know, you, you, you examine yourself. You say, well, when my mama said, be home by 10, don't wear that. I did it anyway. Stayed out till 12 or 1 and was wearing the short skirt. And we both got tired and ended up sleeping together. I got knocked up. And then he hit me in the face, lost half my teeth. And, you know, whatever else happened to you. And it was your fault because your mama said no. And you said yes. Well, what is that? That's sin. It's rebellion. 
And can you admit it? And can you go back and say you're sorry your mother's already dead? And there ain't no mama to go back to. So where you go? You go to Jesus because the church is there. And if they need you to clean up, just go take a bath, come home, you know, go jump in the river. You know, that five bucks, don't buy cigarettes, buy some soap. Oh, they, they got to love me. Well, why don't you love them enough? Why don't you honor God and clean yourself up and quit making it everybody else's problem? You want? Don't you want to be part of that? Be part of the solution. It's not hard to do. They got they built million dollar homes for people like you. They just walk in there and behave yourself and don't piss on anybody and don't behave like you own the place and people go in there and say, This is I'm entitled to all this. This is for me. I paid taxes. You might have. But you're not paying them now. You're benefiting from the taxes you paid. So take it graciously. Well all right, Lord, thanks for you know, hey, I can come in here and they got shower, got me a towel, got me everything's free. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Some of the people in there are not even being paid to help you. And you want to complain, you know, about something. Well, go lay back down in your corner by the dumpster and hopefully they don't run you over with the truck. I seen a guy yesterday digging broad daylight plenty of jobs around could walk down the street and work at Dollar Tree they, they can't keep people anyway they don't there's nobody wants to work everyone learned about getting unemployment for free and and this guy he's able-bodied I'm looking at it I was I was saying Lord is there something I need to do for this guy you know as I do that I, I'll look at people because of the love of God in me and I'll, I'll see is there something I need to do and the Lord said don't no, just watch a minute. He didn't tell me to watch him. It was just my morbid curiosity, probably. He's got this black shroud around him. He's got sunglasses on. Yeah, watch him. He's around the dumpster by the Walgreens. Broad daylight. 12 noon. Could have been pushing a broom somewhere for, you know, whatever minimum wage go to the day center lay down get up do it again put the money in the bank to get enough and get a better job you know build some strength that's what work is for that's why it said if a man won't work he shouldn't eat because you get lazy and lazy and lazier just eating free food you know free food is to give you a little leg up if you need it now you know your wife died and it's messing you up well, sorry if she's Christian you just don't have to be that sorry because if she went to heaven you should be glad but it's gonna hurt I know that so you, you if you need to go inside for a minute go to the mental hospital and let them medicate you for a little bit till you feel better you know or go to your brother's house and just say hey bro you know I can't handle it let me just get, lay here on the couch for a few days and just deal with it and if you got a brother like that cool you got a church member like that cool you got nobody will go to the shelter and just talk to somebody man you know it just hurts and uh, I can't pay my bills because I can't sit there and write a check because I'm just too beat up and mourning you know takes time but don't let it take you all the way out you know and if she wasn't saved you're not saved we'll get saved you know, come to church, sit down. The Holy Ghost would love to minister to you. And he'll help you weep it right through, and you'll get understanding. And you know what? You'll end up on the other side of it, saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, and you'll even pray for that person that's that was lost. Because the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. You're part of the church. you got power to pray. I've prayed for loved ones. I didn't, wasn't good at witnessing when I first started. I wasn't good at living. So they're not going to listen to me much. You know, they did a little, but not enough, and I wasn't good enough. And so getting better, I just like, well, Lord, I started to pray for him. And he said, well, I'll perfect what concerns you. That's God. That's the goodness of God. I'll perfect what concerns you. You know, Jesus went and preached to the spirits in the lower parts of the earth when he first got off the cross. When he left his body, he went down and preached because they hadn't had a shot yet. Well, 
It's the same. If I ask him, he's glad to do it because he don't change and he likes to serve. Jesus is a servant still. Even though he's the king, he still hear your prayers. You don't have to do that, but he does. So no matter what it is, just say, Lord, oof. Just call on the name of the Lord. You'll be saved, you'll be delivered, and just make a habit of it, okay? And that's what church is all about. You make good habits. Call on the name of the Lord. Don't go cussing out. Don't buy a gun. And don't do any of that. Just call on the name of the Lord. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Go free in the name of Jesus. Go free in the name of the Lord. There is salvation in no other. Just, if you can get that much, nothing I've said, get that. There's salvation in no other than Jesus Christ and Him crucified for you. That's the beginning. I get that too. You're just starting when you get saved. So don't think you got to have it all right and don't think you will because you won't. It takes the rest of your life and then when you stand in front of God you'll be perfect because that's what happens. It says when we see him we'll be like him for we'll see him as he is. There's some kind of final transformation takes place when you're allowed to stand in front of the Lord and see him face to face as he is. It just for his own sake, probably says, well, I'd rather you looked a little better <laughs> you know, than that. You know, to really be in my presence, I got to make the final adjustment. So just look at me and boom, you're just the final, you know, tweaking of your, of your soul, your appearance, whatever it is. But, you know, that's not really good doctrine, what I just said, because I don't know that. But it does say there's some kind of, you know, transformation at the end there so it's kind of comical to think of but I can't really say what it is exactly but I know we're transformed now by the renewing of our mind so if I was a glittering rainbow half naked homosexual parading in the street and the next moment I repent and I go wow I've been kind of messed up Lord forgive me and suddenly I put some clothes on and I go into church and sit down and all my gay friends just kind of drop their jaw and go, well, don't you like parading with us out of here frolicking like a bunch of hooligans? Or would you rather be just one of those holy rollers? And you say, well, I'd rather not have that fiery stream when they read that book and how left to center I was. And Jesus saved me. And so why don't you all come to? And they say, well, okay. Can we still be friends and brothers? Well, yeah, well, let's learn what that is. Because that's the right relationship between men as brothers. Brothers in the Lord. You know, a guy comes up to me and says, Hey, brother, and I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, you're married to a man and all this. And I said, you know, I'm going to let you call me brother because you're in church right now. But, you know, let's talk. And so I gave him the brother's advice. You know, you better repent because that fiery stream is getting ready for you. You can't stand in front of a forest fire right now. Forget about standing in front of the fire of God's anger and judgment. We, you know, we can't even wrap our brain around that. But just take my advice, okay? From the word, you don't want to be there in guilt on that day. You'd rather be standing there with Jesus going, what a horrible mess that that is. You know, have you, you'd rather just be the observer that goes, my God, I am so thankful that I did all I could to help somebody else too, you know, that I could stand here just barely. I mean, the, the righteous are scarcely saved. We're barely making it, uh, Christian people, you know, just know that too. If you want to get haughty in all this, this is the righteous are scarcely saved. We're all going to just be kind of like, that should be me too over there, but for the grace of God. And the prayers of my grandma and the labors of all the ministers and everything that God did to move heaven and earth to get me to save. 
I mean, I mean, I could sit here for hours until I already have, but I could sit here for hours <laughs> and tell you all the money God has spent to save me. I mean, I'm a retired veteran. I'm not retired. I didn't do 20 years. I did like a year and a half, but they gave me money because I got injured. And, you know, it was really, I was still a sinner too in a lot of ways. And, and I've had to be in and out of the hospital with head injury and all this. And, and they've spent millions on me, you know, to just let me live. And by the grace of God, I've been able to extend that out to some other people that are living and, and surviving because of that. You know, and thank God there's some kind of use to it. But I think, sometimes I think, God, you had to do so much to get me out of the pit. Wow. I, I had, a, I even had kind of a head start on some folks to at least be able to speak English, read and write, and understand some things. Not that any of that saved me, except for the fact that I could understand what the man was saying on the television that night. I was suicidal when my sin came all, my chickens came home to roost, and I was ready to jump. And by the grace of God, I turned on the TV instead, and some guy come on, and the first image on the screen, he's going, you know, joyful, and I was like, not. And some guy came on that had given his life to Christ and had enough knowledge to say, you know, pray this prayer. And I knelt down in front of the TV right there in that officer, bachelor officer's quarters. And, and I got up from that prayer and didn't want to kill myself anymore. How do you do that? You can't do that. That's God. God's power alone could take me from night to day in a moment like that. Now, did everything just go hunky-dory? No, but I'm here today. And things are hunkier and dorier than they've ever been. <laughs> I still struggle with stuff, but I, I have help. You know, the Holy Spirit is my helper. And I've got church people. There's church people praying for me, maybe even. I pray for some of them, you know. And that's a new thing for me. I've been a long time just trying to find to be able to plant somewhere and I can't say that I'm 100% committed yet but you know I've really labored it, it is kind of hard for me to find a place but I'd go every Sunday somewhere and I've been going faithful the last little bit here trying to plant and, and learn the benefits of planting finally you know I would tend to either get they'd get mad at me or I'd get mad at them but now I'm just kind of learning to weather it, you know, just stay and just see what happens. You know, if I just conclude the matter, then I haven't, I haven't gotten to the end of it, perhaps. I mean, there's just, there's just gray area out there that I don't know yet because I've never really, I know I should be planted. Just haven't really been able to until now. <laughs> no, I'm still... Still trying. One thing I have, I have a good understanding of the scripture and I have a personal relationship with the Lord that he does speak to me. And he will lead me, guide me, say go to this place, go to that place. Because as a more mature believer now, I, I have things to say and to share with people that uh, need a wider audience than just a small group. But I go to the small group because it's, you know, in hope that it will be a family. I can't say that it, it has become that just yet, but I'm hoping it will. You know, we'll see. But I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed. I've been born of His Spirit, cleansed by His blood. I'm a joint heir with Jesus as I travel these times. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And so that is a, a promise of scripture. As many as received him, he gave the power, the ability, the transforming grace, however you want to phrase it, to become 
children of God, even to them that believe on his name, born not of the will of man, the will of flesh, but of God, God's will, not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. So if you wonder why God saved you, that's why, because he wasn't willing that you perish. <laughs> that is the best news, man. I mean, that God wasn't willing that I perish, but that I come to repentance, and that might be today. You know, if I think something, do something, I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He'll deal with me as a son if he needs to get my attention some kind of way. He's done it. You know, I've dropped a Christmas tree on my toe one time when I was working in a Christmas tree lot. And he was showing me, you got to remove your foot from evil. And I was doing things I shouldn't have been doing. And he dealt with me as a son, and it hurt, and it caused me, and a guy ministered some word to me, he didn't even know he was doing it, just by the Spirit. And God will speak to you and help you, because he, like I said, he doesn't change. He's never going to be willing that you perish until he's willing that you perish, which will be when you have just, you know, kept on resisting, kept on rejecting, kept on rebelling and you're willful in it, and you're just, you know, then he'll just be like Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh, in the Old Testament, where Pharaoh hardened his heart a number of times, and then it says, finally, God hardened his heart, and you don't want to be that person drowning in the Red Sea of your sins, you know. So, fear God, depart from evil, be health to your navel, marrow to your bones, you won't have to take bone Eva, you know, or something, <laughs> just, you'll have health, because that's the promise of God, all his promises are yes and amen, through Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father, you know, I'm talking about God, and I'm saying what God has done for me, in part, I could say a lot more. But the promises of God, you know, faithful men and women of God have preached to me. Uh, there's this radio station. I came back to Oklahoma for the radio station. Have you ever heard of anybody moved from California, Oklahoma, because of a radio station? That's why I came back here. There's a station called the Oasis Network that has Bible teaching, like little 15-minute blips of various ministers of the Word of Faith movement primarily that believe the word of God that it applies to your life that you should answer circumstance situations with the word of faith it says no they're saying it's going around but it's not coming here because no weapon formed against me will prosper will put no disease on me he's laid on the center he's the Lord that heals me and by the stripes of Jesus I was healed if I abide in him and his words abide in me I'll ask what I will it shall be done for me and now I have confidence before God because I'm the righteousness of God in Christ abiding in him I go to church in obedience to the command not to forsake the assembling of myself together as a banner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. I don't have anything coming because it's been washed in the blood. I don't have to receive for the wrong I've done because Christ received for the wrong that I've done. And I place my faith in him when I've confessed and forsaken it. And I shall have mercy. Now I might receive for the wrong I've done. But I'm not going to receive according to what I deserve, but according to his mercy. That's what the word of God said. He's not dealt with me according as my deeds deserve, but according to his mercy as he saved me, washed me, regenerated me by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So I don't have to live in an expectation of wrath. I can live in an expectation of good because he's for me. If God is for me, he can be against me because I believe in Christ. Therefore, does the Father love me because I believe Jesus came out from God. And I do always those things that please him as much as I see to do. And he knows, and he knows, and he knows. He knows me. He's acquainted with my sitting up, my rising up, my going out. He's the author of it. I'm not doing anything if he's not doing it because I don't want to do anything without him. I, I go to the grocery store if God says I buy wheat pasta if God says I buy chips if he says if he says no I don't buy them because I'm his he he leads and guides directly says get on here and make a video and talk about the end time that's what I've tried to do but I'm setting you in a way that you see the end time is really when that fiery stream comes for you and if you're not in Christ that fiery stream will take you somewhere you will not want to go and you'll never come out 
So fear God, and there's still a little daylight. The Antichrist is on the way, and I could go into it, but we're laying foundation today. And there's a lot I could tell you about the end. But I'm not really seeing the Lord leading me now. I've talked too much about it. So amen. So the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. If you've uh, never believed in Christ, just believe it. Believe that God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, that includes you. Whosoever means whosoever. Doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been. It matters that you're a whosoever and you're hearing this. So he so loved the world. And while we were yet sinners, okay, this is not God loved us because we were so good. He loved us because he made us have pity on us because we're just lost in a mess. And so he so loved us to send his son, not to just tell us, not to just heal us, but to die for us. It, it had to be done. There was no other way. Because, uh, you know, me dying for you would have been just dirt washing dirt. So he had to send his sinless son, himself, in fact, clothed in flesh, come down to say, Adam, okay, you, you blame me for giving you that woman. I'm going to take the blame. I'm not guilty, but I'll take the blame for you. And on the cross, he died a sinner's death so you and I could live and serve him acceptably with godly fear not having our transgressions imputed to us, but forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. All is forgiven, come home. All is forgiven, come home. The Father's anxiously waiting and watching the road. All is forgiven, come home. If your father and mother can't receive you, well, the Lord can receive you right where you are. You just pray this prayer, a prayer like it. You might just make your own prayer. The main thing is to recognize you have sinned and it's not somebody else's fault only. You know, other people that may have helped you become a sinner, but ultimately it was your decision. And ultimately it may be right now that you're finally realizing it. You know, this may be the first time you realize this is sin, what I'm doing. And that's a blessing. It's called the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes from God through Christ to give you conviction. Your uh, conviction is, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. And it's okay that you're guilty because grace is available. It's a good time to be guilty. This is a good time to be guilty. To see it because, you know, like Peter was preaching those 5,000 guys that had murderous hate toward Jesus and a frothing mob. Crucify the Lord? Are you kidding? And that's what they did. And they were all in agreement. But here's Peter coming out of the smoke himself of denying the Lord and cursing and swearing and all that. And Jesus was gracious to him and said, Feed my sheep. And so Peter stood up and did it. Five thousand of them. Sheep lost. Lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go into the lost sheep of the house of Israel and tell them their Redeemer lives. And I know my Redeemer lives. The one that died for me. Why? Because I can feel them in my soul. I can feel the peace that passes understanding that keeps my heart and mind through Christ Jesus, through no one else. No one can do that but the Lord Jesus. When you call on the Lord and God just extends heaven to you, it's like the veil is torn away and there's this, this, this release of divine power into you from heaven. There's no other place that this this flow comes from. And he gives you all things that pertain to life and godliness. You know, my nose was stuffed up here in Oklahoma, the allergen confluence, you know, all the wind comes right here and blows every kind of thing you could have right up your nose in Oklahoma. And uh, I've got some, you know, here it is, a, a bottle of dollar eighty four is like the most this is the greatest, one of the great miracles of my life here. <laughs> this right here. <laughs> this is not an advertisement, but right there. This is off brand Afrin, right? Equate nasal spray, a dollar. It's like a dollar. And without that stuff, man, I would, it, that stuff has made such a difference for me. 
just to breathe on days. I mean, there there will be times in this state that I am blocked for a whole month. I mean, I'm blocked. My nose is like blocked. And I've got stories to tell with that that I could share. Well, okay, so my nose is blocked up for like a month in February a few years ago. And I hadn't seen this guy since I'd been back. I come back here in 2014 or so. And I come in February, blocked up. I said, Lord, can I go to the VA, get some get some medicine? I said, no. <laughs> For like a month, he said, no. Finally, the day comes, okay, go to the VA. And they give me this stuff, it doesn't really work. But the point is, I'm sitting there, and here's this guy that I hadn't seen in like 20-something you know, years, wondering about him. And he's there. And so we go have Taco Bell or something and buy him a taco and he eats the taco and he like doubles over in pain. I said, Greg, we are going to the ER. He said, no, I'm not. I said, yes, we are. So I drove him up to OSU Medical Center downtown and in not in 10 minutes, the guys come back and say, you got a tumor like this big inside of your gut. And before you know it, he's at the VA getting it all taken care of. His family's around him, his legs are swelled up, and he comes out, goes to the nursing home, and he lives. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know? And God knew I cared about the guy, because we'd been kind of in the Word together in my early years. And I come back here for that radio station, ain't nothing like it in California much, you know. And I was missing that kind of spiritual, you know, just beauty of the holiness of that. They're not perfect. They don't teach everything just right. They're not right on the end time, but maybe they will be eventually. I'm trying. <laughs> but uh, that was a miracle. And But now, a <laughs> dollar and a half, I can just shoot it up my nose. and mm. Praise God. Just little miracles there. And it's not 40 bucks like it should be. Because <laughs> what I get for that, I mean, I could pay 100 bucks and be okay. I'm glad I don't have to, is my point. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. So here's what I tell people. You got a church in your mind? And keep going until he tells you to go somewhere else. Go with God. He'll go with you. Thank you, Lord, for saving our souls, for forgiving us our sin, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Lord, help the people that may be listening to see their need, to turn on your word. Lord, we could we could talk about it for all day long, to sit here and talk about it. Homosexuality is abomination to God. Leviticus 18. Thou shalt not lie carnally, with a man as you would lie with a woman. It's abomination. You can't even put on clothes that's a man's. If you're a, a woman, you're not supposed to put on clothes that you're a, a man, a woman if you're a man. It's abomination to God. That's the law. Now you're under grace, so you know your job requires you to wear a certain uniform. You're not, God's not trying to condemn you for that. But you shouldn't be trying to look like a man if you're a woman. You shouldn't be trying to look like a woman if you're a man. You should be trying to look take keep confusion away okay don't allow confusion to take root and you start drifting and now i gotta be a man now i gotta be a woman no just resist the devil he'll flee from you and pray say god give me opportunities to enjoy my gender that i am enjoy the sex that i am Help me to appreciate my role in society as this thing and this feminine grace or this masculine humility that I have, this servant's heart. You know, either way, there's no male or female in the spirit, but that doesn't mean you're not in the natural. The natural is the natural, the spiritual is the spiritual. And when it says there's no male or female in the spirit, that means God can put his gifting through any person. That doesn't mean you change your gender. It means that you, we are not necessarily subject to it in a spiritual situation if God needs to put a miracle through a woman he can do it if he needs to put a word through a woman he can do it but in terms of roles and authority in the church the women aren't to be 
usurping authority over men, but if there's no men, then you got, God's got to raise up women, and that's what has happened. And so we see a lot of women that are anointed and appointed to preach and teach because, you know, first of all, you just need more hands on deck. You know, if a woman can teach the Bible right, let her do it. But, you know, she should be in subjection to a man because of the original sin. You know, Eve is a weaker vessel, and women just are weaker in the flesh, and so that susceptibility is still with us, and so we have to acknowledge it. And we have to temper them and help them as men. If we, if we see them, we take them aside. We say, well, you know, you could just kind of understand it this way or understand it that way or maybe be not so screechy and screamy and, you know, trying to make a show and, you know, just kind of sober up and teach the Bible and, you know, or whatever. Uh admonition hopefully the women are humble enough to recognize well maybe I am getting a little bit scary with this and weird and maybe I could just come back down to earth and and take a little correction and you know we should be all ready to have correction or input or feedback at some point hopefully it's in love for the edification and not because we just want to lord it over somebody men so and we're not here to lord it over them but we're here to be hopefully a little more level sober because the end is with us and now I feel like I can go a little bit into that so Daniel 7 5 if you're still with me even if you're not uh, somebody can get the tail end of this maybe um, no the Lord is saying no okay well the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit both now and forevermore as you hope in him I know whom I have believed and persuaded he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. That should be your soul first. Get your oxygen mask on, right? And then you can help others because you'll be breathing right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for saving our souls. Just wait on him for a moment. 